check. Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. It is so good to see all of you. I have missed you so much. And uh, I'm starting to tear up, actually. <laughs> but uh, no, it's great to have you back. And for those who are watching online, welcome. Uh, just uh, we're experimenting with an outdoor service here, so if the sound isn't the greatest, please bear with us. And uh, we're doing our best. We may have something different rigged up next week um, if this doesn't work out. So welcome, and uh, we're glad that you're here. And I hope that you enjoy the presence of the Lord here today. So if you love Jesus, give him a big shout of hallelujah. Amen. All right. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for giving us this beautiful day. And uh, Father, I just pray uh, that your blessing would be on us. Lord, that we would uplift and glorify the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you would draw some people here that have never been here before. And uh, Lord, for any who are watching today online, I pray for a special blessing on them. And Lord, I pray for a special blessing on all the dads today. Jesus name amen happy Father's Day to all the men and uh, it wouldn't be Father's Day without a dad joke all right so what's the uh, what's the best way to watch fly fishing a live stream all right here we go if you want to stand you can if you want to be seated by all means, enjoy your freedom in the Lord as we sing. You have song sheets inside your bulletin, and you can follow along there. We're doing this old school today. Oh, 
so nice to be worshiping together again beautiful day we're looking forward though to when they give us the okay to go back into our air-conditioned building <laughs> and uh, yeah amen this one might be uh, be new to some of you it's certainly not a new song but it's a beautiful song by Paul Beloche it's called King of Heaven and if you know it sing it extra loud
Let's sing that line again. King of heaven, come. King of heaven, come. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We just lift your hands towards heaven and just say, Come, Holy Spirit. We invite you here. We invite you to do your work in our hearts and in our church and in our town and in our province and in our nation. We need a mighty move of God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. church just lift your hands towards heaven and worship him this morning king of kings and lord of lords
Thank you, Father. The Bible says in John chapter 14, this is the words of Jesus, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. You believe my Father, and I'll trust also in me. And then he said, I am going back to my Father so I can prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. And we, we as believers, we look forward to that great day when Jesus comes back for his church. We really got nothing to worry about because whether, whether we go by way of the rapture or whether we, we die physically, we're in the presence of God for all of eternity. Hallelujah.
light upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my hope in you alone, and I will not be shaken. Hallelujah. Lift your hands towards heaven and give him praise, church. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness and your grace. And we thank you for your great love. And we thank you for giving us this day to assemble together. We're grateful for that, Lord. Lord, we pray for those in authority over us, that you would give them wisdom as they lead, as they lead us through this pandemic. Father, that there would be a nationwide turning to you. We pray, God, for all of those who are still sick by this virus, that you would touch them in the name of Jesus. Lord, you are the great physician. There's nothing too impossible for you. Lord, we rebuke cancer in the name of Jesus. We speak healing, Lord, into sick bodies. We, sp we speak uh, restoration, Lord, into broken marriages and into broken families. And, Father, we pray for a mighty, mighty move of God in our nation. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So if you're close by your family, you know, give each other a big hug and give a little wave to everybody else. So I'm getting a... A glare on my tablet. I hope you don't mind that I'm preaching to you with my shades on. I'm not trying to look cool. I because I know that I look cool even without them. So <laughs> if you have your Bible with you or you have a device with you, uh, you can go ahead and turn to Psalm 23. And you can take out your message notes which are which are on your bulletin. Um, for those watching online, there's a link uh, from my post yesterday uh, where you can download message notes and follow along there. So we've been, we've been in a little series on Psalm 23 called Living in the Goodness of God, and we're breaking down the 23rd Psalm, statement by statement, to learn several things about living in God's goodness. Folks, I believe that God is, is, is a good God, and I believe that He wants to be good to you. And he wants to be good to me. <laughs> now, life is a series of choices. Uh, we make our choices, and then our choices make us. We make our decisions, and if we make good decisions, we become successful. And if we make bad decisions, then we have to live through the consequences of that. Every decision has a consequence, whether it's good or bad. And the potential for error is great because we are imperfect people. Now maybe some of you who are watching today or some of you who are in attendance today are struggling with a difficult decision. Indecision is one of the greatest sources of stress in your life. And yet your Heavenly Father does not want you to be stressed out. He doesn't want you walking through life worried and anxious and everything that accompanies that. He wants you to trust Him. He doesn't want you stuck in indecision. Now the Bible tells us in the book of James that a double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And that word unstable in the Greek, it literally means stag staggering around like a drunk. When you're pulled in different directions about a decision that you need to make because you just can't figure out which way to go, it creates enormous tension in your life. 
And then a lot of times after you make a decision, you start second guessing yourself. Did I make the right choice? And then when you do that, you just prolong the pain. Now what's the solution to this? The solution is to let God guide you. And that's what we're going to look at in the fifth message of this series. The Bible tells us that life is a journey, and God has given us special tools to help us on life's journey. God gives us a road map for life, and that's your Bible. And if you're not in the Word every day, you are going to go in the wrong direction. He gives you a compass for your life, which is your conscience. And if you have a relationship with God, the Holy Spirit in you acts as a conscience. And then this, that leads to the third thing. He gives you a personal guidance counselor for the rest of your life. And that's the Holy Spirit. And a personal guide is the best thing of all. Now Psalm 23 and verse 3. I love this verse. It says, He guides me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. He wants to guide us down the right path because He doesn't want us to mess up our lives. This has to do with making right decisions, and He keeps us on track. And so the question becomes, how do I learn to let God lead me in the paths of righteousness? So that's what we're looking at today. Now, we're going to discover that there's some things that you need to start doing, and there's some things that you need to stop doing in order to let God lead your life. The question it all boils down to is, why is it so difficult for me to figure out what God wants me to do with my life? Why does it seem that God's will is hidden? But it's not hard to figure out what God wants to do with your life, and he's, His will is definitely not hidden. We're learning in this series, folks, that God is a good God, and He has great plans for your life, and God wants you to understand those plans. And because He is good, He has promised to guide. The Good Shepherd doesn't just feed us, He leads us. He doesn't just correct us, He directs us. And in the verse that we just read, God promises to guide us. In fact, if we've never felt guided by God, that's a problem. One of the evidences that we're followers of Christ with God's uh, Spirit dwelling inside of us is that we are guided by Him. Romans 8 verse 14, it says, For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. And it becomes vitally important that we learn what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about being led by the Holy Spirit. Those who are led by the Spirit of God, the Bible says, are children of God. Now in this journey, there's some things that we need to stop doing. There's some things that we need to start doing. And if we want to be led by God's Spirit, that's what we need to do. That's what I'm going to share with you today. So I want to start by sharing with you the things that we need to stop doing. Okay? Things that we need to stop doing. If I want to be led by God's Spirit, number one, this is very important. I must stop following a culture that doesn't follow God. If I'm trying to follow God, I am never going to be able to follow Him if I am following a culture that doesn't follow Him. You can't run in two directions at the same time. You're either following God wholeheartedly or you're not following Him. So if you're wanting to be led by the Holy Spirit, the first thing you need to stop doing is following a culture that doesn't follow God. This verse, Exodus 23 and verse 2, it's very direct. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. That's an important verse because the prevailing idea in our culture today is if it feels good for you, do it. And it doesn't matter what God has set in place. If you're not happy with how you were born, you can change it. And as followers of Jesus, we do not follow it. We do not follow the world in going against what God has set in place. And this is a culture, friends, that does not follow God. Now, I want to share something else with you. I'm going a little bit deeper. 
just because something is legal doesn't make it right. They have legalized marijuana, but that doesn't mean that God's okay with it. They've legalized all kinds of things, but that doesn't mean that God's okay with it. And you cannot hope to be led by God's Spirit if you're following a culture that doesn't follow God. Do not follow the crowd in doing wrong. Now, many people make decisions in life based on what is acceptable. Well, I just want to fit in, and if they're doing it, then I'm going to do it. I don't want to st stand out, and that's a prevailing attitude. And there's great pressure out there, and I know that you know this. There's great pressure out there to make you conform to the culture. And you cannot conform to our culture and just be like everybody else and then hope to be led by the Holy Spirit. Now this problem was Israel's biggest problem for thousands of years in the Bible. They kept trying to be like every other nation rather than the chosen ones of God. And repeatedly God had to tell them that they were going against His will. And He gave them all kinds of moral laws and civil laws and ceremonial laws because they were His people. He wanted them to be different than the rest of the world. To show the world the hope that is in God. Now today, many believers have accepted the standards of the culture. And so they try to be politically correct. And they try to be culturally correct. And that's where this next verse comes in. Romans 12, verse 2. Do not copy the customs and behaviors of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. And one of the reasons you may not know what God wants you to do is that you may be too invested in following the culture. And because of that, you cannot get in tune with God's Spirit. And so you have to decide, do you want to go along with the world or do you want to follow God? And when you decide to stop copying the behavior and customs of this world, then and only then are you in a position to let God transform you by changing the way you think. And when he changes the way you think, then you will learn what God's will is for you. And the Bible says that his will is pleasing and his will is perfect. His will for your life is good and pleasing and perfect. Now one of the downfalls of following the culture is that it's all temporary. Whatever is in style this year will be out of style next year. Why don't we follow the culture? 1 John 2, verse 17. The world and the desires that it causes are disappearing. But if we obey God, we will live forever. You shouldn't care about what this culture demands. In eternity, you will be with God forever and forever. While those who follow the ways of the world are in eternity in torment forever and ever. So if I want to be led by the Spirit of God... I need to stop following the culture that doesn't follow God. Secondly, if I want to be led by God's Spirit, I must stop following friends who are not led by God. If my friends are going in the exact opposite of the direction that God's going, I have to make a choice. Am I going to go the direction that my friends are going, or am I going to go the direction that God's going? And we need to stop letting unsafe friends influence us and set the agenda of our lives. One of the reasons that we don't hear from God is because we're hearing from them. Now let's do this. Let's drink this. Let's watch this TV show. Folks, there are some things that a believer should never put their eyes on. Because they pollute our minds. The culture values something called open-mindedness. Here's the problem with open-mindedness. Some people are so open-minded that their brains have fallen out. <laughs> All the garbage we put in our minds is never forgotten. Did you know that? It's never forgotten. Have you ever wondered why you have weird dreams? Garbage in, garbage out. Everything you've seen on TV is in your mind. Every cuss word, every rape, every murder, every act of violence, every bit of nudity, it's all in there. 
I can't follow friends who are not led by God. Now, why is this so important? One of the things that causes people to miss God's will for their lives is peer pressure. And you need to know, peer pressure is not a phenomenon for teenagers only. You can get peer pressure at work. You can get peer pressure at get-togethers. 1 John 3, verses 7 and 8. It says, Let no one deceive you, my children. Whoever does what is right is righteous, just as Christ is righteous. Whoever continues to sin belongs to the devil, because the devil has sinned from the very beginning. If I have a friend at work that starts to brag about all the girls that he's been with, and I listen to it, and I laugh at it, and I don't take a stand, I'm following that friend, and according to this verse, who am I following? So what do we do about it? Proverbs 13, verse 20. Whoever spends time with wise people will become wise, but whoever makes friends with fools will suffer. In other words, you can't soar with the eagles if you're busy running around with the turkeys. Choose your friends wisely. And if you want to follow God's direction, I cannot let culture get me off track. And I can't even let friends get me off track. Now, am I saying that God wants you to give up your non-Christian friends? Well, maybe in some circumstances, but generally, no, I'm not saying that. God does want you to have some friends who are un unbelievers, but God wants you to influence them. Jeremiah 15 and verse 19 says, You will be my spokesman. Let this people turn to you, but you must not turn to them. The Bible teaches that we're to love the people of the world, but we're to hate the value system of the world. So if I want to be led by God's Spirit, I can't follow the culture that doesn't follow God. I can't follow friends who don't follow God. And then third, I must stop looking to other sources besides God. If I'm looking for direction in my life, the best place to look is not on a TV talk show. The best place to look is the Word of God. And then talk to the Creator who made you. That's where you're going to find direction for your life. There's many other sources that want to tell you how to run your life. Let me forgive you, for instance. I've known people over the years looking for direction for their lives, and they believe they can pray to God and read their horoscope. Really? That's like saying, I believe in reincarnation and heaven at the same time. If you're a follower of Christ, don't even look at that section of the newspaper. Okay? You can't believe in, in God and that. They're mutually exclusive. God wants us to look to Him instead of other sources for guidance. And some people say, well, Pastor, it's just harmless fun. It is not harmless because when you look at that, you open the door to spiritual oppression in your life. By the way, when you're trying to find out about the future and you're going to sources other than God, the Bible calls that divination. And there are all kinds of things out there that offer this. Psychics. You know, all over the place, maybe not right now during the time of COVID, but all over the place they have psychic fairs where you can go in and pay them to tell you your future. Fortune telling and tea leaf reading. Ouija boards, horoscopes. You know, in ancient days, they used to kill an animal and cut out its liver and read the liver for direction for your life. Isn't that crazy? You can read about that, by the way, in Ezekiel 21, where the king of Babylon, looking for a sign as to what to do, killed an animal and looked at the liver. <laughs> Deuteronomy 18. Let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist, or who consults the dead. Anyone who does these things is detestable to the Lord. So if you're into any of these things, God wants me to tell you as your pastor who loves you, stop it! <laughs> Repent and turn back to God. 
If you engage in any of these things, you're never going to hear from God, folks. All right, let's move on. If I want to be led by God's Spirit, I have to stop being led by my circumstances. I have to stop being led by my circumstances. Now, maybe you're here and the first three that I mentioned don't relate to you, but this one certainly does. A lot of people feel they can determine God's will by the circumstances of their lives. I missed my appointment today. That must be God's will. My car ran out of gas. I guess it was God's will for me to walk. I slept in today. It must be God's will for me to miss church. You're skating on thin ice if you organize your life around the circumstances. There's lots of stories in the Bible where the circumstances are the exact opposite of God's will. I think of the story of Jonah, where God said to Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach to them. Jonah knew that they were the sworn enemies of Israel because they had oppressed Israel for a long time. Jonah said, nope, I'm not going. And instead of following God's plan, he jumps on a ship headed to Tarshish, which is as far away from Nineveh as you could get. The circumstances, there was a ship headed for Tarshish. He had the money for a ticket. They had enough space for him on board. It must be for God's will for all of that to come together. But you know the story. God caused a great fish to swallow Jonah up. And then he ended up being spit out on the shore in Nineveh. If you're not in God's will, you're going to be miserable in your life until you are in God's will. Another example would be David. Okay, He just sent his army off to war. He's at his palace, lollygagging around in his PJs up on the rooftop. And he looks over and he sees this beautiful woman taking a bath. And he's attracted to her. And he begins to think, well, her husband is off fighting a war. And the circumstances are right. And so he has an affair with Bathsheba. See, placing trust in your circumstances can lead you down the wrong path. Satan, by the way, can manipulate your circumstances so that you veer away from God. So watch out. Now, here's one more thing we need to stop doing. I must stop being led by my feelings. If I want to be led by God's Spirit, I cannot be led by my feelings. You know why? Because your feelings lie to you all the time. Every emotion is temporary, whether it's a good one or a bad one. You can be elated at your wedding, and it won't last. There's, it's only a matter of time before you have a disagreement with your spouse. You can be elated at Canada's Wonderland, and that won't last. You know, you can be elated in Florida, but that won't last. You say, well, if I could just get, you know, if the borders just open and I could go on vacation, everything will be okay. Here's the problem with that. When you go on vacation, you take you with you. <laughs> now, the same is true on the opposite end. If you're discouraged, it's not going to last. If you have a panic attack, it's not going to last. No emotion can stay at the same level of intensity all the time. Now, a lot of well-meaning people, and I might add, a lot of well-meaning Christian people will say, let your conscience be your guide. And I hate to tell you this, but your conscience can also be wrong. Jeremiah 17 and verse 9, it says this, The heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? We lie to ourselves more than we lie to anybody else. Just because we think it doesn't make it true. Just because it's popular doesn't make it true or right. Now, a lot of people, maybe most people, base their decisions on how they feel, feel. but feelings lie. We need to base our lives on, on decision-making truth. Now, check out this verse, Proverbs 14, verse 12. There is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. The contemporary English version says it like this. You may feel you're on the right road and still end up dead. The result of trusting your feelings? Isaiah 53, verse 6. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to his own way. 
These are all the things that we need to stop doing if we want to be led by God's Spirit. Now, what are the things that we should start doing? Now, these are very easy to understand, and these are going to be a lot quicker. If I want to be led by God's Spirit, number one, I must want to be led. I have to desire it first. The only way I could think of to demonstrate this desire, imagine somebody holding your head under water to the point where you are desperate to breathe air. We need to be like that in our desire to be led by the Spirit. Are you craving the presence of the Lord like that? Like it's a matter of life or death that you need God's presence in your life. If you don't have intensity and passion in your prayer life to know God's will, don't be surprised if you don't find out what it is. Psalm 40, verse 8. I desire to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. So if I want to be led God's Spirit, I need to really want it. How bad do you want it? Do you crave it like you crave a drink of water? Second, if I want to be led by God's Spirit, I must be willing to do what God says. I need to be willing to obey in advance. You need to be willing to pray something like this. God, I don't know what your will is for my life, but whatever it is, I say yes right now. God doesn't give you his will for your life, and then you choose whether you want to do it or not. It's about trusting him. You need to be willing to surrender your life completely to him. John 7, verse 17, Jesus said, Anyone who will of God will know whether my teaching is from God or is merely my own. Thirdly, if I want to be led by God's Spirit, I must look to God's Word. Okay? You're going to find God's will in God's Word. Psalm 119, verse 105 your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. If you're not in the Bible every day, you're in the dark. Psalm 119, verse 133. Direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. So here's a couple of statements about the word of God. Number one, and I mentioned this just a minute ago. God's will is found in God's word. Most of God's will is already revealed. No, the name of your spouse is not in the Bible. Okay? The principles are there for how to find the right spouse, though. But as you read God's word, he speaks to you. When you open your Bible, God opens his mouth. When you close your Bible, then you're not directly hearing from God. We discover the will of God in the Word of God. So I want to say it to you this way. Stop listening for a voice and start looking for a verse. Some people want God to write it in the sky. Why would He write it in the sky when He already wrote it in His Word? Now most of us, if not all of us, already know aspects of God's will. So the key then for knowing God's will is to do and obey what you already know to be God's will. Now here's the second thing I want you to write down. God's not going to contradict His Word. If you get an idea and you can't find a basis for it in the Bible, I want to submit to you today that it's probably wrong. God has already given us His Word. People say, well, I had this impression. That's good. Let's look to the Bible and find out what it says about that. Cults get started because someone follows what they think is a good idea, and then they end up leaving the Bible behind. Check out Galatians 1 verse 8. Maybe you didn't even know this verse was in the Bible. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. But even if we, or an angel from heaven, should preach a gospel other than the one we preach to you, let him be eternally condemned. Even if the, an angel were to appear to you and tell you something that isn't written down in God's Word, don't trust it. The Bible is your authority. The Word of God is your authority. 
God's will is found in God's word. And if you commit to read it, God promises to guide you. And if you act on what God has already told you to do, he's going to tell you more. Number four, if I want to be led by God's spirit, I must ask the Holy Spirit to be my guide. Now in high schools, they have a position called guidance counselor. You go to them, they can help you with your career choices and things of that nature. Well, we have a guidance counselor for our lives, and he's called the Holy Spirit. And he is the author of God's Word. And when you read it, he brings illumination to what you read. And he helps us to understand it. We have to be willing to ask the Holy Spirit for guidance. James 4, verse 2. I love this verse. You do not have because you do not ask God. God is interested in every detail of your life. And one of the best ways to hear the Holy Spirit is to ask a specific question in prayer. Psalm 27, verse 11. Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me down a straight path. Now, how does God lead me in a straight path? There's lots of ways, but let me just give you a few. Primarily, he reminds us of what is already written in the Word. When you memorize Bible verses, it is stored in your heart. And at just the right time when you need it, the Holy Spirit brings that verse that you memorized to the forefront of your thought to guide you. And he can also put ideas in your mind. When God puts an idea in your mind, it's called inspiration. When you get an idea from the Bible, that's called revelation. But when you rely on your own thinking, that's called stupidity. <laughs> so I'll never forget that. All right. Here's two things about asking. First, ask humbly. Psalm 25, verse 9. God guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. And the humbler you are in coming to God, the better. And then secondly, ask in faith. Say, God, I need to know what you want me to do in this situation. And I'm expecting you to give me an answer. And then you thank him in advance. James 1, verses 5 and 6. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault. And it will be given to him. But when he asks, he must believe and not doubt. Because he who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. And then verse 7 says, That man should not think he will receive anything from the Lord. A lot of times we don't know what God wants us to do because we're not asking in faith. You can trust God. He's always right and you have to believe him. And then finally... If I want to be led by God's Spirit, I must listen for God's response. This is a big reason also why we don't hear from God. We ask, and then we run off, and we don't wait. We don't be quiet. We don't listen. We don't pause. We ask, and then we go about being busy. And when we don't take time to sit and listen, how can we expect God to get through to us for the answer? We really need to try to take a quiet time every day so we can hear from God. Job 33 and 14, God speaks in different ways, and we do not always recognize his voice. He uses the Bible, he uses pastors, he uses teachers, and he uses other Christians. And there is no limit to what God can do. The key, though, is to test it by his word. So I want to close with a verse from Psalm 77. It's a verse about Moses. God sent ten power plagues on Egypt, and after the tenth plague, Pharaoh finally let the people go. Not too long after they left, Pharaoh and the army pursued them. He had changed his mind. The Israelites came to the Red Sea, and they were hemmed in. And there were mountains on either side, and there was an ocean in front of them. And Pharaoh's army were right there. And all of Israel thought that they were goners. The name of the place they were called was Belzephon, which means God's hidden treasure. God had, had them right where he wanted them because he was about to do something amazing. Suddenly the ocean splits in half, and you know the story. They crossed the Red Sea on dry ground. Now imagine how in shock everybody had to be. And when they got through to the other side, God allowed Pharaoh's army in, and then the water closed up, and they all drowned. 
This verse in Psalm 77 talks about it. Verse 19. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen. Folks, there have been many times in my life where I've come up against big barriers. Financial barriers, approval barriers, physical barriers, energy barriers. I got a nine-year-old energy barrier. Family barriers. There have been situations where I thought I couldn't pass through. And I submit to you today that in those moments, God has you right where He wants you because He's about to do something big in your life. Remember this verse. God, your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters, though your footprints were not seen. The Israelites could not see the path. And there are times when I can't see the path. But just because I can't see it doesn't mean that it's not there. If you want God to lead you, you got to stop doing the five things that we talked about. And then you need to start doing the other five things that we talked about. And when you do that, you get God's guidance. And He shows you a pathway that nobody knew was there. God will make a way when there seems to be no way. He works in ways we cannot see. He will do the same for me. He will be my guide and hold me closely by His side. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, let's just bow our heads for a moment. Maybe you're watching today. Maybe you're here today. And uh, you have not begun a relationship with Christ. And that's the starting point. You need to be willing to say yes to Jesus. The Bible says it like this in Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10. That if I confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord, and I believe in my heart that God raised Him from the dead, I will be saved. Have you ever confessed Jesus Christ is Lord with your mouth? Those of you watching online, have you ever done that? Do you really believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died on the cross and then on the third day He rose again? I'm going to tell you something, folks. I believe it, and I believe that it is the best attested fact of history. Jesus Christ is a risen Savior. You've got to put your faith in Him. You just say something like this, Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have not followed your ways. Today, I say with my mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe that God raised Him from the dead. Jesus, please forgive me of my sins and be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, Amen. And if you made that decision today to follow Jesus with your life, I want you to get a hold of me. You, you, can, you can message me through Facebook on our Facebook page. You can, you can call the church. You can shoot me an email, Pastor Jason at hurontel.on.ca. I'd love to hear from you and encourage you in your steps as a new believer. Also, as a church, we rely on generous giving. And if you want to give, you can give by e-transfer to fwrcdonation at gmail.com. Those who are here, we have an offering plate on the table over there, and you can drop your offering in the plate on your way out. I want to thank you all for being here today. It's been wonderful to be together. Hope, uh, hope, yeah, amen. And I hope you all remembered your sunblock so that you don't go home looking like a lobster. God bless you folks. <laughs>